what really is the big deal about cover crops? What's the big deal about organic matter? Well, my world is the world of fresh produce, okay? And so in the fresh produce world, we use lots of clean tillage. And if we look at organic systems, that's how we control most of our weeds, is tillage. Whether that's hoeing, whether that's rototilling, whatever it is, we're stirring that soil. So that creates all sorts of things. One, just like we've talked about today, that aerates the soil, and it's kind of like hitting the turbo on your car. I mean, all those microbes that are in that soil, when they get all that extra oxygen, they kick in and they're working even harder and faster than they normally do. So a result of that is we end up with low organic matter soils. Uh, this figure of a half to seven tenths percent organic matter is pretty much reality in most tilled soils in Oklahoma. So there's some real problems with that. Low or poor drainage, poor aeration because of the there's not enough organic matter in there to create the poor space that the soil needs. Uh, the other thing with, that, with reduced poor space is it's difficult for our soils to pick up moisture or to intake moisture into the, into the soil horizon. And so we can't hold moisture very well. Uh, if you're in a, in a real light soil like a sand, sandy soil, you can't hold nutrients, you can't hold moisture, you really got a problem. Uh, years ago, we lived in East Texas. We had a very, very light soil. They call it sugar sand in East Texas. I called it silicon dioxide. There was nothing in it. And uh, the first year I gardened in that soil, I had to water every day. I had to fertilize once a week, and it was just crazy. So I started adding organic matter. I had a friend that had a horse stable. I started putting horse manure into that soil. After about three or four pick up loads of horse manure in one year into that soil. The next year, I needed to water maybe once a week, maybe fertilize once a month. So it just dramatically changed everything, and that's from organic matter. And so when we have this low situation, then we lose production, and that's, that's a big deal for us. The thing that I really like about cover crops, I like to call it grow in place organic matter. So I like compost, but it's a lot of work to, to uh, create compost. You know, you got to turn the piles, and you know, if you're going to do that on a large scale basis, you're talking about some serious equipment. You're talking about tractors with these great big machines that stir the pile, and it's a lot of effort. Uh, if we're talking about bringing in, uh, say, chicken litter or something like poultry litter, you've got to ship. In, you've got to spread it. All that takes time, takes money, takes effort. Uh, but that's the nice thing about cover crops. We don't have near as much effort into the system. We still have to plant. We're going to have to kind of chew it up or grind it up at the end and get it back into the soil if we're in a, in a uh, tillage system. So the bottom line, I think, is that it's easier, less involved. Uh, but, and this is the caveat or the the <laughs> comma but statement is it takes that ground out of production while those cover crops are in the ground. Now you say, well, that's no big deal because, you know, we only grow in the summer and we don't grow in the winter. Well, that's not necessarily true. I mean, we've got vegetable crops that we can take clear through the winter, okay, outside. We live in the southern plains, so we have that option. So we're going to be in lieu of cover crops or of cash crops. So some benefits, uh, we've talked about all this stuff. It's a lot more biological activity when we've got more organic matter in the soil, and that's a good thing. We have some reduced inputs. So there's some real promises here that, you know, it's very promising for us as farmers, and I don't care if we're talking about the Brandenburger farm is 100 square feet, but I still consider it a farm. I'm farming. I'm planting crops, I'm harvesting crops, I'm growing crops. So it, it helps us all. So some other benefits is uh, preventing erosion. When we've got that cover on the ground, we don't have to worry about that soil uh, leaving as easily as if we have that soil bare. This picture here is a picture at the Perkins Station. This is in the spring. 
This is cabbage that's been planted. We've left cover crop between the rows of cabbage. And boy, you know, when you are in Oklahoma in the springtime and the wind's blowing 40, 50, 60 mile an hour, and that's not that odd, if you don't have some kind of wind protection, your crop just gets beat to death, okay? Because these are nice, young, uh, fast-growing transplants. They're soft, and they just can't take all that abuse. The other thing that it does is it reduces the chance that you're going to lose soil to wind erosion. And that's a big, big thing for us on soil health. So it, it does a lot to protect our crops. We can speed water infiltration. You know, when we start talking about having that uh, rainfall at one, two, three inches an hour, and that's not, we've had a lot of those kind of rains in the last two or three years. And it's just like the sky just kind of opens up and they, somebody just takes the bucket and just, the good Lord just takes the bucket and dumps it out. You know, there you go. You want it four inches? You got it. <laughs> if we got that ground covered, we're going to be able to pull up a lot of that uh, moisture will actually penetrate the soil and go on down into the soil profile and be stored there. If we don't have organic matter in the soil, we're going to have a real trouble doing it. Most of it will run off, be in the bar ditch, be in the river, make a mess. So it reduces compaction because I, I guess what I should have found was video of raindrops hitting. I mean, it's like an explosion. And so when that ground is covered, that ground does not get pounded. I mean, it's just like, think about, you know, laying there and having all that hitting you in the face. It, it hurts. It's, <laughs> it's going to compact things. Uh, we'll have an increase in soil microbes and also improve nutrient recycling or cycling. Uh, one of the things that we've got at Perkins is we have low phosphorus levels in our plot areas, okay, down there on the farm. And what we've noticed is when we've had these cover crops, uh, particularly some of these uh, fast-growing grasses, basically that grass's roots are going down and it's mining phosphorus and bringing it back up into the topsoil so our crop is going to have it. We've actually had phosphorus levels increase and we're not adding phosphorus. So that's one of the things that cover crops can do really well. We get improved tilth and fertility. When we look at organic matter from cover crops, uh, we've got a couple things going on here. The active part is the easily decomposed part. It's kind of these sugary, sugar-rich, protein-rich types of uh, molecules. We get those types from, say, legumes. You know, the thing about a legume, you can have this much legume and you plow it down in the ground and man, it breaks down really fast, releases a lot of nutrients but it also makes a lot of, of these compounds available for the microflora or the, the microbes in the soil. The stable part, which is what we call humus, it's woodier, it's more far, uh, fibrous, uh, has a lot more carbon in it. And that really comes from grasses. You know, when we look at, at cereal grains or, or uh, forage grasses, they are masters at creating carbon to be in the soil. So what soil gets from active and stable organic matter is it gets these sugars that act as glues to actually glue soil particles together, makes better aggregation. That's what actually opens the soil up. Instead of having, say, uh, a billion soil particles in my hand, I might have you know, half a billion or a quarter of a billion if it's aggregated, if it's been glued together. So that helps for water infiltration, aeration, all those things improve. And then these root exudates from grasses act as glues also. So there's a lot of things that we really gain from cover crops in the soil. Cover crops can also soak up nitrogen. So if you've got a crop like cabbage, we use a lot of nitrogen for cabbage. You know, I always tell people you put the pedal of the metal and you just you hold it on the floor the whole time, okay? So we might use 150, 200 pounds of nitrogen per acre to grow a crop of cabbage. Well, what about all that nitrogen that's left at the end of the cycle? Boy, if we could get a cover crop in there to soak that up and hold it in the plant rather than it becoming a pollutant 
or a you know environmental problem, that would be great. Cover crop soil is slow to take water up, which means that particularly with nitrogen, it's not held tightly at all by the soil particles. And so when you get a big rain, it's kind of like going to the restroom and flushing the toilet. I mean, it whoosh, it's gone. It just goes right on down through the soil profile and, it, and you're not gonna see it again. Whereas if we have soil cover, we're not gonna have near as much water penetrate that that soil profile as quickly and we're not gonna lose as much nitrogen. It also, this calcium and potassium can be mined by cover crops, we talked about that a little bit, phosphorus also, and then legumes encourage mycorrhizal growth. So all those things are big pluses for us in nutrient management. Grasses are great sources of organic matter, we've talked about that. They can tie up nitrogen. Legumes are a potential nitrogen source uh, you know, if, if I was totally an organic gardener, probably one of my biggest issues is where do I find nitrogen sources, right? Because I, I still need nitrogen to grow crops. Uh, they're not going to grow without it. So legumes can provide that nitrogen, and we'll, we'll have a picture here in a minute or two to kind of prove that point. So there's a lot of great things that can go on deep-rooted cover crops, something like a tillage radish or something like that that's deep, deep rooted, can help break up hard pans. So there's a lot of advantages. Here's some potential cover crops that we've used, winter wheat, cereal rye, Austrian winter pea, crimson clover. We've used all these in work that we've done at Perkins. Part of the reason we like crimson clover is it grows well here in the southern plains but it's so doggone pretty in the spring. I mean, in the summer, pearl millet is another annual forage grass that we can use. We're actually using some of that. Good old hay grazer, it's hard to beat that. It seems like it's pretty tough. It'll tolerate a lot of, of environmental stress. And then cowpea is really our, our choice of a summer legume. Several years ago, we were looking at two or three other summer legumes, and I hate to say it, but they're just total wimps. We tried Lab Lab, we tried uh, Sesbania, and yeah, they grew and they're legumes, but when it got really hot and dry, they were just sitting out there going like, oh man, I am dying, okay? <laughs> you know, they just, they couldn't cut it. The cow peas, right next to them, they're going like, what's wrong with you people? I'm, I'm great, you know, I'm loving it. It's hot, I'm, I'm feeling good. So we're using uh, a forage type. Uh, sometimes we use red ripper, sometimes we use iron clay. But uh, I, I, I'm sold on a cowpea when it comes to a summer legume. So grasses or legumes, how about using both of them? I mean, you know, you kind of, you gain carbon from the grasses, you gain, you can pick up some nitrogen if you've inoculated your legume, so it's kind of the best of both worlds. We did a study for three or four years where we were doing winter, winter cover crops and then we were planting pumpkins following those winter cover crops. Now here's the deal. This, these two pictures were taken on the same exact day, okay? This is not, <laughs> this is not three weeks earlier. This is the same day as this picture. This is the pea clover mix, so we had legumes, winter legumes in the ground. That nitrogen was released once we broke that material up and, and plowed it in and then planted our crop. And here's the winter wheat thing. I don't know. Which one would you rather have be your crop, okay? <laughs> it's obvious we've got plenty of nitrogen here that was already in the ground ready to go once that, those legumes broke down. So you need to think about the production system you're in when we first started with cover crops at Perkins, what we were trying to do was no-till. And that was a, a good try, but what happened was our weed control was just a total mess. We just couldn't make it happen. So what we went to was strip tillage. We've still got a lot of cover crop, but then we're actually tilling in the area that we're going to plant. And that seems to work for us. But again, that comes back to what works for you and in your system. 
So you got to have the right crop mix, match the field and rotation. You know, you're going to have to figure out if you can rotate out and then grow your cover crop and then come back later with an, another cash crop. There are lots of advantages or disadvantages. This is not a, you know, in biology or maybe I should say in farming. The way I look at farming is it's like we're trying to manipulate this huge biological system, okay? It's complex. It's complicated. There are no you know, absolute black and white answers. There's a lot of answers that it's like, yeah, that might work, let's try it, okay? So what can cover crops accomplish? Last year, actually this last spring, I believe it was the NCRS, had a soil health conference, okay? And one of the guys that came and talked at that conference was Brendan Rock Rocky, okay? He is a farmer, he and his brother farm in the San Luis Valley in central southern Colorado, okay? They're potato farmers. Now you talk about a system that's hard to figure out how am I gonna do this without um, synthetic inputs. But what they found was they were getting where they were, they were going to the poor house because they were spending so much money on inputs, synthetic inputs. They were spending money on insecticides, fungicides, herbicides, fertilizer, big water bill. And water is a big issue everywhere you go, okay? And, uh, you know, essentially what they, they came to the conclusion that either they were going to change or they were going out of business. That, that's how serious it was. So they said, well, what can we do about this? Well, they, they went to several conferences and said, you know, we're going to start using cover crops. So after listening to Brendan talk in January, he said, well, we're going to have a field day at our farm. So I thought, you know what, I'm going to go to that thing. So I went to the field day, packed up my wife. She went, she said, why are we going all the way to Colorado to go to a field day? I said, just bear with me, baby. You know, <laughs> she, she's one of those kind of bottom line kind of people. She's like, she's not an accountant, but she's close. You know what I'm saying? So we went and uh, so they are, at this point, they are nearly organic, okay? They, they have, I think they have three different uh, pieces of land. I think each piece is a, is a quarter section. So I think they've got three quarters of a section of land that they farm on. Each quarter section has its own pivot system. and. Uh, they will rotate out of growing crops and then they will grow just cover crops and then the next year they'll come back around and, and plug crops back in, cash crops back into that area that was cover crop the year before. Um, they're seeing a lot, they're conserving a lot of water because of the fact that they have a lot more water holding capacity in their soil now because of, the, of adding organic matter through cover cropping. Uh, they've had a major reduction in cost, and Brendan will tell you this, they are not, they have not improved their yields. Their yields have basically stayed the same. But what they have done is, you know, because what we all exist on is, what's the difference between how much money comes in the door and how much goes out? And so the amount of money that's going out to pay for all those synthetic inputs has gone way down, and so their profit margin has gone up. They're making money again. So they're pretty pumped about this. They've been doing it, I'd, I'd say, probably seven or eight years. You know, they're really into diversity. Their cover crop mix has, I think, 14 or 16 different species in it. They work with uh, Green Cover, which is a company out of Nebraska. They will tweak your cover crop seed mix however you want it done. So they've got a lot of diversity in their cover crops. But one of the other things they're doing in the potato crop itself, they're actually growing pollinator plants to bring in different pollinators and also beneficial insects. And in fact, they've been so successful with using these uh, pollinator plants in their crop, what they're doing is they're actually, they're producing some potatoes for sale for people to eat, okay? They're fingerling potatoes is what they're specialized in but they're also increasing their seed. So they're a seed potato supplier. So all their seed potatoes are tissue cultured and then they're grown in the greenhouse. They're actually using banker plants in the greenhouse. 
And so they're using no pesticides to control. I mean, and there's, trust me, in the greenhouse, it's like all the insect pests come in and go, whoopee, let's go. You know, this is great. You know, we're loving this. But they're actually controlling those pests or managing them without pesticides in the greenhouse. So that's one thing that they've gained by doing all this in the field, and then they've moved it on into the greenhouse. So they're using some compost, a little bit to kind of, let's say, seed the, the microbes into the soil. But the, really, the cover crop is where all that organic matter that those microbes need is coming from. The last thing I'll mention about their system is uh, imagine a pivot system, and then they, they section off probably eight or ten parts of that. And then they have uh, a herdsman that comes in and herds, uh, brings cattle in and grazes those off. And so what has happened, the first year they did that, the, the cattleman came back in and he says, well, you looks like they cleaned up all the cover crop. You ready for me to move these? And they said, well, you know, you look around and we still got a lot of pigweed in here. Can you keep them in here a little longer and get that pigweed grazed out? And the guy says, yeah, you know, a day or two, it'll take care of it. By doing that, what's happened is they've actually reduced the amount of weed seed in their fields and they've reduced a lot of their weed population, which I went, gee whiz, wish I'd thought of that. <laughs> but what a neat idea. So this, this combination of cover crops and then grazing to, to manage weeds. Uh, cover crop seeds, you want to make sure, like any other seed, you want to make sure that you're buying high quality seeds. You know, I did mention uh, green cover can give you uh, pre-mixed combinations or custom seed blends. That's pretty cool that they can do that. Or you can create your own mix. You can buy, you know, like that's what we really started out doing is mixing uh, cereal grains with legumes to make our own mixes. But you want to also make sure that you store that seed properly. You know, seed, most of our seed is stored at about 40 degrees and then low humidity. It'll last quite a while that way. But if you're at 40 degrees and high humidity, it all gets buggy and mildewy and just turns into a big mess. So just a little word to the wise there. When you get this, the notes for this, you ought to go and try some of these uh, YouTube connections I've got here for you. There's several there about planting cover crops by hand. That's what we did over here at the garden with Haldor uh, a few weeks ago. Building crops with cover crops, importance of cover crops, inoculating. Uh, legumes, how to do that on a small basis. You know, when I looked around, there were lots of, of information on how to do large batches, you know, 50, 100, 200, 300, 400 pounds of seed, but nobody was talking about, I only need this much seed inoculated, how do I do that? So that little video does that. Uh, my source of, good source of information is Managing cover crop properly. These are both SARE publications and then building soils for better crops. That's a, those are excellent references.